Welcome to the Deseret Audio Library. On this cassette, you'll hear noted speaker Dr. David A. Christensen speaking on the topic of faith, the power to get through the day. Brother Christensen is the director of the LDS Institute at the University of Utah. And now, Dr. Christensen. It's a pleasure to welcome you tonight. My greatest desire is to do what the Lord wants me to do, to say what I ought to say, based on not only my experience in the church and as a child of God, but also uh, because of my love for the Lord and my desire to teach the truth, undiluted, perhaps not all of it concerning faith, but at least that portion which I have learned that might be helpful to you. For a long time, I didn't, uh, you know, I hesitated to do tapes simply because I felt that I uh, didn't have anything to say or at least that it was not significant enough to say it. But um, now that I'm older and extremely mature, I have a wonderful feeling that if I'm ever going to say anything, it needs to be uh, said now while uh, I can still function. As you know, the title of our lecture tonight is uh, Faith, Power to Get Through the Day. I am a very practical man. It's not that I doubt the Lord nor his ability to exalt me. My concern is not that. Eternal life, to me, is a reality. But what I'm concerned about is today, and probably better said, tonight. It's the night time. It's when the sun isn't shining. It's when uh, there isn't brightness outside and it's dark. It may be dark in the house or it may be dark in the house. But one way or another, it is that moment that I'm concerned about. How to get through the day, not through eternity, but how to get through today and tonight. That's the critical issue. And I believe that what the Prophet Joseph Smith said was true that a religion that cannot make you happy in this world certainly doesn't have power to do it in the next. So if faith doesn't work now, you know, a lot of good it would do in the next world. Now, I will take several principles. I want you to understand that I understand that faith is such a consuming principle that it's not possible to do everything concerning faith in one lecture. You know, I know that Elder Jean Cook has a tape out on faith. I understand that. I understand that many of the brethren have written on faith. Joseph Smith has the lectures on faith. But we've got 90 minutes in which we can examine just some of the elements of faith which, in my opinion, are critical to our achieving of sufficient faith to get us through the day. After all, it is the first principle of the gospel, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And faith is, above all things, faith is power. It is almost tangible. You can feel it. You can feel faith. You can feel the power of faith. I have a quote here I brought from the Prophet Joseph Smith on the first lecture concerning faith, and I will read it, and I would like you to think about it seriously. The prophet Joseph Smith said, Faith, then, is the first great governing principle which has power, dominion, and authority over all things. Without it, there is no power. Did you hear that? Without faith, there is no power, and without power, there would be no creation nor existence. By this, we understand that the principle of power which existed in the bosom of God, by which the worlds were framed, was faith. And that it is by reason of this principle of power, existing in the deity, that all things created exist. Had it not been for the principle of faith, the worlds would never have been framed, neither would man have been formed of the dust. It is the principle by which Jehovah works and through which he exercises power over all temporal as well as eternal things. Now listen to this. Take this principle or attribute, 
faith, for it is an attribute from the deity, and he would cease to exist. It is the principle of power by which God does what he does. You know, I know a lot of men who have the Melchizedek priesthood and are good men, but somehow a lot, and I'm not critical, I'm just saying I know some men that have the Melchizedek priesthood, that it doesn't seem to work well. I mean, there isn't a lot that happens in their lives. Is it because they don't have the Melchizedek priesthood? Not at all. It is faith that is the actuating power of our lives. It is the principle by which God himself works. Now, I will finish the quote. Who cannot see that if God framed the worlds by faith, that it is by faith that he exercises power over them, and that faith is the principle of power? I'll repeat that. That faith is the principle of power. And if the principle of power, it must be so in man, the generic term, man and woman, as well as in the deity. This is the testimony of all the sacred writers. Are you with me? Faith is power. You want your life to be productive? You want to be able to accomplish things? Do you want spiritual manifestations? All of it depends on the power that we generate, and that power is called faith. No wonder that faith is the first principle of the gospel. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you have your scriptures with you, I would like to have you turn with me to a couple of uh, verses. What I'd like to do is establish a, um, a definition of what faith is, and then we'll go from there. The second part of this lecture is how do you get it? I mean, what is it? Well, you can't get it unless you know what it is. And secondly, how do you obtain faith? How is that done? Now, the first scripture is in Alma. Do you have it? Now, those of you who are listening on tape, it would be helpful if you also opened yours scriptures and looked at it at the same time as you're driving in your car when you listen to this. And then please keep your eyes on the road and don't worry about it. All right, Alma, chapter 32. The first definition of faith I ever learned was in Alma 32. It's a very fundamental definition of faith. It is also misleading if you're not careful. It isn't misleading. We misread it. I will read the definition given by Alma in Alma 32, verse 21. And now, as I said concerning faith, faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things. Get a clue. Therefore, if you have faith, you hope for things which are not seen, but which are true. Now, boy, how many times have we read that? I will read it again. Faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things. Now, let's take it that far. Now, what we do as LDS is we flip that coin over and we say, okay, now, faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things. So we flip the coin and we say, all right, now, if faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things, if you have perfect knowledge, you don't Need what? You don't need faith. Well, my goodness, we just read from the prophet Joseph Smith. He said that faith is the principle of power by which God works. So that can't be right, can it? God works on the principle of faith. And he has perfect knowledge. Don't you think that God has perfect knowledge? If he has perfect knowledge, then does he need faith? Yes, because it is the power by which he works and by which we can work also if we want to and if we learn how in this life. I'll tell you one thing. Our lives would be much happier if we would learn to work by the principle of faith. Now, he says, faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things. I believe that what Alma meant by that is simply you don't have to have perfect knowledge of things to have faith. How many of you have perfect knowledge? Those of you who are present, raise your hypocritical hand. How many of you have perfect knowledge about anything? 
I feel that I know some things well, but perfect knowledge. Faith is not perfect knowledge, but it does not mean that if you have perfect knowledge, you don't have faith. You don't have to have perfect knowledge to have faith. Therefore, if you have faith, you hope for things which are not seen, but which are true. You hope for something which you can't see, but which is true. How many of you know anything about the celestial kingdom or exaltation? Can you see it? Can you imagine it? Can you imagine creating your worlds? Can you imagine visiting me in my kingdom and looking at my square earths and saying to me, well, you haven't got perfect knowledge yet, have you, David? Can you imagine that? I can't imagine that. But faith is to hope for things which you can't see, but which are true. Is there a celestial kingdom? Is there an exaltation? Is it possible to reach it? Yes, it is, and there is. Yes, absolutely. Faith is to hope for that thing which is not seen, but which is true. Now let me give you an example, all right? Because I know you love stories as well as scriptures. So we'll combine them both tonight. Let me tell you about the first time I learned anything about faith. I was young. I knew a little bit, but the first time I really experienced internally faith. Did you hear what I said? When I really first felt, experienced in me, the power of faith. I'd heard about it. I'd seen my dad use it. My dad was a fine man. I saw him and my mother use it, but I had never used it. I was on my mission. This was in the late 1800s when I served (laughs) in Brazil. In those days, Brazil was only one mission. Believe me, if the mission president wanted to lose you, he could do that because Brazil is gigantic. We were in the city of Curitiba, my companion and I. I know you don't have favorite companions, but he was certainly toward the top of the list. And he was a brand new elder. He didn't speak any Portuguese. There was no MTC. Provo had not been founded yet. (laughs) And so we just went from Salt Lake City on our missions, got on a boat. We didn't fly. We went on a boat, arrived in Brazil. And I had been in Brazil for some time. He was a brand new companion. And I was, I suppose, what we would call his trainer. And we were so compatible that we hit it off well from the beginning. But my companion, right at the very first, was smitten with amoebic dysentery. Do you know what that is? Do I need to describe that for the listening audience? I don't think so. Amoebic dysentery is brutal. And every two hours, whether we wanted to or not, we returned to the church house where he would refresh himself. (laughs) And in those days, we didn't have chapels. We were in a store downtown, Curitiba. And above the store was the church. And above the, the church was our living quarters. While he was up refreshing himself one day, I was down leaning against, outside, waiting for him, leaning against the wall in the shade. It was very hot. A taxi drove up and out stepped Brother Oliveira. Brother Oliveira was a wonderful man. His daughter Rita was one of our favorites in the branch. Cute little girl, about six. Brazilian and so very short. Cute little thing. We just loved her very, very much. He stepped out of the taxi and came up to me and he said to me, Elder, and then he began to cry. I mean, he began to sob. You know, and you're a 19 or 20 year year old kid and you don't know, you know, what do you do with a man who stands in the street and sobs? You know, and I, there's one thing I've learned to do very well from a very young age and that is to hug. So I just took him in my arms and just put my arms around him and let him cry. And then I walked him into the the church house. Uh, We sat down in uh, in one of the benches there. And I said, now, when you can talk, you tell me what's wrong. And he told me. And it's the age-old story. Rita, his beautiful little six-year-old, they were playing soccer. They were the soccer ball went out into the street. She ran after it. You know what happened. Along came a truck, a big truck, going about, oh, I would imagine... 25, 30 miles an hour. The bumper of the truck, the same height as the child's head. So that when she stood up 
and was hit by the truck. It hit her head. It just picked her up and threw her through the air, left her shoes right there, just hurled her, and she came down. Well, I suppose ordinarily we would think that she would, should have died, probably should have, right there on the spot, but they rushed her to the hospital. And then Brother Oliveira said this to my companion and I. He said, I would like you to come to the hospital. Now, he did not say, I would like you to ad- administer to my daughter. He didn't say, I would like you to bless my daughter. He said, I would, would you please come to the, the hospital and heal my daughter. Now, for my whole life, I've heard about faith. I have read the scriptures. I've studied. I've been a pretty good missionary. I've tried to do my best. I have really seen the fruits of faith, but never really been put up against the wall as far as faith is concerned. So I said, okay, we'll be right there. The hospital was a half an hour away. Took him and put him in a taxi, got my companion, Elder Tolman. When he came down, I said, we need to go and administer. And I explained the story. And we knelt down, and uh, at least in my heart, had what I think the scriptures would refer to as a mighty word of prayer. And then we got in, and I said, now, Elder, you're going to have to anoint, but I want you to anoint in Portuguese. He said, I, how, I, I don't know. I said, you can do it. And we began the process, and for that next half an hour, I taught him how to anoint. Well, very simple. Portuguese. <clears throat> Just the basics. We got to the hospital. Now, does God know what he's doing? Is he in charge of this world, or isn't he? He is. You have to understand that in those days, the Catholic Church controlled everything. Controlled the schools, the hospitals, the politics, the government, everything. So, they controlled the hospitals. Therefore, there were nuns sitting at the front desk. But the Lord, I'm not in charge of this. I went up to the the two nuns sitting at the desk there and the Lord had prepared the way. We are Protestants. We're Mormons, so we're considered Protestant. We are not allowed to give blessings in a Catholic hospital. So I said, I went up to the nurse, and she looked, and she said, uh, you're American. Are you missionaries? Yes. Did you come to see that little girl they just brought in? Yes. Uh, well, they have sent for the Catholic priest to administer the last rites. Now, if you hurry, you can beat him there. And if I'd have had time, I'd have said, have you heard of the Mormons? Would you like to know more? <laughs> she said, down the hall. But we were in a hurry. Down the hall, first hall on your left, second door on the right. I can still see it right now. I relive it right now. Walk down the hall, first hall on the right, second door on the left. We opened the door and went in. You have to understand this was 1950s. There were no fancy IVs. This is Brazil. There was not a lot. They did what they could. They had anesthetic and things, but they were not sophisticated. And Brother and Sister Oliveira were sitting there crying their eyes out. And there she, Rita, was on the bed. They had done nothing for her. There was nothing to do for her. So Elder Tolman and I walked up and looked at her. He said to me, I'm going to pass out. I will not describe her to you because you, uh, it would make you sick. I will just suffice it to say that the blood was running out of both ears and down her neck. And she was blue-gray and looked like death. And I just looked at her, and he said, I'm going to pass out. I said, if you pass out before you anoint her, I will kill you. (laughs) So with that encouragement, he said, well, then let's do it, because I am sick. And I walked over to Brother and Sister Oliveira, and I said, how is your what? What did I ask? How is your faith? Faith is what? According to Alma, faith is power, but... It is, it is what? To hope for something which you can't see, but which is true. What I needed to know 
brothers and sisters, was what was true. What did the Lord want me to do? Not that I questioned my ability to do it, although there was some you know, feeling, but what do you want me to do? So he anointed her. Oh, you should have heard it. His Portuguese was broken and crummy and the most beautiful Portuguese I have ever heard. I said, now don't touch her. Don't touch her head. Anoint her neck down here by the bone, the collarbone. Anoint her there. And so he poured the oil on her neck and then I took it from him and he anointed her. There was a feeling that entered the room. I can't exactly explain it. It's not possible to explain. It's possible to experience. And then he looked at me. I can't explain this either, but when two missionaries love each other like we loved each other, there was a look. I don't know if he knew it, but he looked at me, and what I saw in his eyes was the most confidence. He looked at me like, Elder Christensen, you can do anything. And we just looked at one another. And then we laid our hands together on her neck. And for the first time, I understood what I am teaching you tonight. And all of a sudden, I knew what Jesus Christ wanted me to do and what he wanted me to say. And I sealed the anointing. And in the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ promised her that she would live that she would be baptized and complete her mission. And then that was all. And I completed it. After we took our hands off, Elder Tolman slumped to the floor. He was, a, you know, kind of a wimp. And I, and I, of course, was very strong. And so uh, I went over <laughs> to the Olivetas and we gave him a big hug and And uh, I looked back at uh, Rita on the bed, and she did not move. And that was the beginning of the battle, because she didn't move. We went back, got in the taxi. I didn't speak, he didn't speak, and we went back to our tracting area and worked that afternoon. And then that night, and when it was all done, we talked, and he said to me, "Do uh, Elder Christensen, he said, I... Don't speak Portuguese well, but I understood what you said. You promised her that she would be healed. Do you believe it? Ah, the promise. It is to hope for something which is not seen, but which is true. But you know what? After the blessing was over, I couldn't see it anymore. Any of you gone through that? At the moment you receive it, I knew the promise was true, but then the fight began. Two scriptures come to mind, James 1, verse 6. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. You want to see tossed? I was tossed. And then ether, 12 and 6. And now I, Moroni, would speak somewhat concerning these things. I would show unto the world that faith is things which are hoped for and not seen. Wherefore, dispute not, because ye see not. For ye receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. It's to hope for something not seen, but true. Wherefore, dispute not. Because you see not. Now the battle began. Because I couldn't see it, but I knew what I had felt. Oh my. Just because you know something is true doesn't mean that you don't waver at all. And I wavered somewhat. That night we had prayer. Went to bed. He went to bed. I stayed up. Stayed down on my knees for a long time. When finally I went to bed, I tossed and turned. The battle was on. I knew the promise given by the Savior. You were, are you with me? I had it. It's to hope for something which you can't see, but which is true. And I knew it was true. 
and I couldn't see it, but I knew I did not dispute what I had received. I only was afraid. And so the next morning I got up early. I didn't sleep. And then when I couldn't stand it anymore, we got up. And I said, I don't care what the mission rules are. We're going to the hospital. I could not stand it. The suspense was driving me crazy. We got in the taxi, went to the hospital. <clears throat> I didn't care if there were nuns and priests and the Pope standing at the place. We were going in. And I just went, we just walked in. I said, hello. And we walked back by them and down the hall, first hall on the left, second door on the right, whichever way I said that. And <laughs> Well, you have to understand, you know, I've entered senility. You can't expect a lot. <laughs> opened the door, but as I opened the door, you can't imagine my heart. Faith, absolute faith, I knew what the Lord had promised me. I hoped for the thing which was not seen, which was true. I did not have perfect knowledge in that thing. But I knew what the Lord had said, and I prayed, Oh, God, oh, please, 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 oh, don't let her be dead. Oh, please, open the door. Immediately looked over at her bed where she still was, sitting up, playing with her doll, ready to go home. And I went, oh, it is true. It is true. And I learned more about faith in that 12 hours or so than I would learned in my whole life. It's to hope for something which you can't see, but you know it is true. Now, let's add to that the second element. The second element now, for our understanding, is found in Hebrews. Hebrews is in the big book. The word the back. Hebrews 11, chapter 11, verse 1. You all know it, but there's an element that Paul adds here to Alma's definition which is wonderful and absolutely critical if you are to develop faith. All right, are you ready? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And you say, oh my, isn't that wonderful? Faith is substance. Oh, whippy, I've got faith, so I've got substance. And then you say to yourself, well, I wonder if the prophet Joseph Smith changed that. I think I will look in my footnote. And see if there's something else there. And you look in your footnote and behold, well, what do you know? You check your footnote and you're rewarded. There it is. Joseph Smith changed it. Faith is the, what? The assurance of things hoped for. It's the assurance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. It is the assurance of that thing which you hope for, which is true. It is the assurance. It is power. It is the assurance that the promise is true and that you will receive it, whatever that happens to be. Do you believe me? Think about your life. Think about your faith. And ask yourself, if in your quest for faith, when you have filled it powerfully in your life, hasn't it been an almost tangible assurance that the thing that you hope for will be given? There is spiritual evidence that it is true. Now I will give you our example of that. I have chosen Orson F. Whitney, an apostle of the Lord. An experience which I think teaches this principle. You know, if we just hope for something all the time, that's one thing. But it's so nice to receive assurance, <laughs> isn't it? It's nice to receive evidence. That is what I call power. Here's Elder Whitney. As a young and inexperienced missionary, I was visiting a family of saints in the coal mining region 
near the town of Akron. A married daughter of the household came trudging through a snowstorm with her two little children, a distance of three miles, to get me to baptize her. I did so, the immersion taking place in a little brook running through her father's lot. It was February, and the weather was extremely cold. The moment I stepped into the icy stream, a pain shot up into my heart, and I feared for a moment that I would have to step out again. Remember, this was before pacemakers. (laughs) I feared also that the little woman would not be able to endure it. So I silently prayed that the water might be tempered. Immediately, there was a change in it, or else in me, for I could not feel the cold anymore, nor did she complain of it at all. The baptism over, she went her way rejoicing, but I was in distress. A pain had seized me in the elbow of my left arm, and it steadily grew worse. That evening, I used some liniment upon it, but got no relief, and my arm continued to swell and stiffen. I could hardly move it next day, but by that time I knew just what to do. Are you with me? I knew just what to do. There was some consecrated oil in the house, but my green inexperience had made me think that it would be improper to use it on myself, there being no other elder present. But suffering had opened my eyes. May I say amen to that? (laughs) Suffering had opened my eyes and my faith was strong. For I felt that the pain had no business there. That night, I carefully washed off the liniment, applied the holy oil, and rebuked the pain in the name of Jesus. The effect was instantaneous. I turned my arm over The pain was gone, and I have never felt a vestige of it since. Did you follow that story? I think it's a goodie. I think it teaches the point. There comes a time in our faith where it is not only to hope, but it is to receive the assurance that what we hope for is true. And it is evidence of the thing that we want or need. Well, let me put it this way. We have a handicapped son, Carrie. How come I have not yet healed him? Why have I not put my hands on his head and healed him of his handicap? Do I have the faith to do that? The question is not even Material. Absolutely, I do. I have faith to heal him. Absolute. Then why not? Because I cannot get the assurance that the thing which I hope for is right. There is no spiritual evidence to me that that will ever be given. Does that invalidate my faith? No. It's just faith but in reverse of what we just read. There is no assurance of the thing hoped for. Could I do it? Absolutely. But faith is also assurance that the thing that you want is true. It is the evidence of that. Therefore, while I have faith, I cannot exercise the power of faith until I receive that assurance. Does that make sense? All right, now, we will add now one final definition. This is uh, one taken from the book of David Christensen. It's not in the scriptures, but it's a scripture to me as I know anything about. And I will give you the definition, and then I'll explain it. This is the definition now, the third one. Faith is to believe without any doubt. Oh, yes. Now we're in trouble, aren't we? 
tossed about by the waves of doubt. It's tough. Let me tell you where I got that definition. I hope you don't mind another story. Are you okay? For those of you listening on tape, they are very wide awake, this audience is. I have a nephew, Craig. He's born spina bifida. Do you know what that means? Born with an open spine. He has no feeling from his waist down, so he can't walk. He gets around with uh, a wheelchair and he gets around with these uh, braces, you know, on his leg. And then these steel crutches that you that fasten on the arm. Uh, he's a wonderful young man. He has a because he literally has to drag himself through uh, life. And so he has a humong. He's a good-looking kid. Has a humongous upper body. His, he has a kind of an upper body I will have in the resurrection, <laughs> when all things are restored to their perfect frame. Well, whether or not, I, as long as I'm there. Well, he went on a mission. Being a good missionary was disobedient, not to the mission rules and not to the commandments, but most missionaries who are really good push themselves beyond that which is reasonable, don't they? And that's why their bodies have to be renewed from time to time or they wouldn't make it. The Lord is very kind. But being a good missionary, he went down to the MTC and did the wrong thing. The doctor had said to him, Now, Craig, you need to stand up as much as possible. Do not sit down and don't get up and down. He has no feeling. There is very poor circulation, so he's not supposed to sit for long periods of time. And he's not supposed to get up and down because that's very hard on him. So just stand at the back as much as you can. But being a good missionary, he didn't. He was up and he wanted to be like everybody else. What? What's wrong with that, huh? And so he had faith. And so he went down there and he sat for hours. He was up and down all the time, just like all the other missionaries. Until after he'd been there about two weeks at least, there was blood that was coming through, he and his companion noticed, blood coming through the, his pant in the hip. So they took a look at it and what had happened because of his being up and down, the brace on his leg had rubbed against the hip and had opened him up because he has no feeling. And so there was a long open wound, not too wide, but open, and it was a mess. As soon as the doctor at the MTC looked at it, they gave him a medical release and sent him home. He received a blessing. In the blessing, he was told that he would be healed. He would go into surgery, but that he would be healed. All right, now there it is. Okay? Faith is what? To hope for something which is not seen, but which is true. In fact, it is the assurance of the thing hoped for, the evidence of the thing not seen. All right, he's got the promise. What's the promise? How many of you have promises unfulfilled? Well, he went into surgery. The promise was that he would be healed. He had faith. He was not healed. They cleaned out the wound, took a patch of skin from his back, did a skin graft on the hip there, did the operation. didn't work. Didn't work at all. The doctor said, it doesn't look good. Sloughing off. So they sent him home. After a few days and he recuperated, they took him in later and performed the second surgery, which also did not work. Neither did the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, etc. Nothing worked. Only the problem was the wound does not stay the way it was now widens, deepens. It's very, very serious. They talk of eventual amputation, of delay, etc., etc. Well, what's wrong here, folks? You received the promise, and there's, it's not fulfilled. So he wasn't satisfied. The doctor said, you'll just have to live with it that way. So he went up to the University of Utah, a wonderful place. <laughs> Went up to the University of Utah, to the medical center, and met with a young, a prospective member, surgeon. And he looked at Craig and he said, Well, Craig, we'll give it one more shot. But if it doesn't work this time, 
So they uh, did a muscle. They were going to do a muscle implant, take muscle from his leg, put it in the hip, do another skin graft. and uh, So he went in and I said, uh, would you like uh, another blessing before you go in? His father was unable to give him a blessing, was not in the home. My sister, his mother, was uh, a single parent at the time. And so I said, would you like a blessing? And he said, oh, that'd be wonderful. Will you give me a blessing, Uncle Dave? And I said, nope, I won't, but I'll get you a blessing. How would you like a blessing from Elder Paul Dunn? He said, oh, oh, do you, could you, do you know him? And I said, oh, Craig, I know most of the brethren. You know, I knew too. So I said, I'll see if what I can do. And I had done some work for Elder Dunn, so I called him up on the phone and said, Sir, you owe me. <laughs> and Elder Dunn, who has a wonderful sense of humor, said, And as a matter of fact, I do. What can I do? And I told him, and, he, and I said, You can give a blessing to my nephew. And, and then I could feel the smile, even on the phone. And Elder Dunn said, Well, you know, David, you have the same priesthood I do. Oh, that. Oh, behold, it ticked me off. <laughs> really bothered me and I said please don't be smart with me and he laughed he said I would be delighted would you bring him over Friday at 10 a.m. I was just on my way to San Diego California to do and know your religion and we were there and uh, oh I was excited for Craig and Elder Dunn did what he did so well does so well he put me in a corner and he put my sister in another corner, and then he took Craig up to him, right next to him, and began to talk to him, you know, eye to eye, knee to knee, you know, just the way that Elder Dunn does that. And he said, now tell me about your problem. He did. Tell me about your mission. He did. Tell me about your problem in the mission. He did. Now tell me about the blessing. He did. And you're not healed. Is that correct? That's correct. How's your faith? He asked. Craig responded, well, I thought I had some. But you're not healed. No, I'm not. I see. Do you know what your problem is? Are you listening to me? Do you know what your problem is? You have not called down from heaven the blessings to which you have a right. He said, you know, Craig, knowledge is dangerous. A lot of knowledge is even more dangerous. When that knowledgeable surgeon walks in and says, Craig, it doesn't look too good, then what happens to your faith because of his knowledge? <laughs> right. Your knowledge, you are filled with doubt because of his knowledge. He said, let me tell you about my surgery. And he did. His open heart surgery that was performed by a fairly good surgeon, Elder Russell Nelson. And the sparing of Elder Dunn's life through the blessing of a little man who blessed him just before he went into surgery by the name of Kimball, Spencer W., in which Elder Dunn was promised that he could live if he desired. He said, you know what, Craig? Faith is to believe without any doubt. And then he made reference to something I now read from the prophet Joseph Smith, doubt and faith do not exist in the same person at the same time. So that persons whose minds are under doubts and fears cannot have unshaken confidence. And where unshaken confidence is not, their faith is weak. And where faith is weak, the persons will not be able to contend against all the opposition, tribulations and afflictions which they will have to encounter in order to be heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. He said, Craig, you can't have faith and doubt at the same time. Okay, he said, you ready for your blessing? Yes. David, would you help me? I said, I'm on a tight schedule, but I yes, I will be happy to do that. <laughs> Walked over, waited for Elder Dan to put his hands on Craig, and then I put my hands on top of Elder Dan's, and I was blessed to have a great experience. Elder Dan simply talked to Craig like a father would talk to his son. 
Then he seemed to leave us, and then he talked with Heavenly Father as intimately as ever I have heard any man speak with the Father. And he reasoned with the Lord. The Lord said, Come now, let us reason together. Elder Dunn did. He reasoned with the Lord about this boy. And then he came back, and then he said these words, which I will always remember and which are true. He said, We do not bless you to be healed. I will always remember that. We do not bless you to be healed. You've already been blessed that you will be healed. What we do this day is bless you with the faith to call down from heaven the blessing to which you have a right. And then he prophesied of my sister things he knew nothing about. And then the blessing ended. My sister stood and she was crying. I was very strong. I stood and took my hands from Craig and there was not a particle of doubt. There was not a particle of doubt in my entire being. I knew that he would be healed through the surgery and miracle of the Lord. Then he took Craig up by those massive shoulders. Oh, he's so good. And held him there, put his finger in his face, kind of smiled at Craig and said, Now, Craig, no more doubt. Do you understand me? No more doubt. And Craig knew. Faith is to hope for something which is not seen, which is true. It is the assurance of that thing. It is power. In fact, it is so powerful that without doubt, you can do anything that is right and true. He went into surgery, by the way. He was healed so quickly that the surgeon stood aghast. And Craig said, uh, Should we tell him that it had nothing to do with them, Uncle Dave? I said, Not till you pay the bill. Then you can tell them. Faith is power. This is the end of side one. Please continue listening on side two.